Well, good morning. It's good to see you here on this long Labor Day weekend. I'm excited for us to get into God's word here in just a minute. And I'm also excited that toward the end of our service today, we are going to have the opportunity to celebrate communion together. And so this will be a special time for those of us in this audience, in this congregation today, who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. You are invited to participate in this with us. So right now, I'm going to go ahead, in case you did not get a set of elements this morning as you came in. If you would just slip up your hand right now, we have deacons who are going to be moving through the aisles. They will be happy to bring you one. So lift them up and keep them up until you get one to make sure they see you. And then when it comes time in our service, you will have these and you will be ready. Okay. So as we begin this morning, I want to share something. Uh, This was a headline that was in a in the newspaper uh, about 16 years ago. And it said this, Elton rocks a royal tantrum. Now, here's what was going on. Elton John was in England. He was about to perform a a concert. He was at a venue. uh, He had this live audience. There were going to be thousands there for his concert. There were going to be even more watching on TV. This was a huge event. But while this event was going on, Prince Harry and Prince William were in the vicinity. And so there were police barricades everywhere. And so as Elton's limo driver pulls up to the venue, the police stop him about 50 yards from his dressing room. And so Elton, they roll down the window and uh, he says, I'm sorry, you can't go through. And Elton begins to tell his chauffeur, just just go around, ignore the officer, just just go around. And so the chauffeur is about to do that and the officer discourages it. He says, I wouldn't do that if if I were you. I don't care who you are. If you go around this barricade, you will go to jail. And so Elton begins to throw a fit. He climbs out of the limo and he just walks the 50 yards to his dressing room. And as he is doing this, you can, people said you could hear him screaming at the officer as he walks away, don't you know who I am? Now, singers, athletes, famous people, right? That's not uncommon for them to kind of think, I'm a pretty big deal, right? People who are wildly successful, you may even know people who aren't wildly successful but still think I'm a pretty big deal, right? I mean, it could be that that could be the case, but it's not uncommon for that for people to feel that way, to say, "Don't you know who I am? I'm somebody. I've done something." Now, today in our text, we're going to read a passage in Acts chapter 21. It's about Paul's time in Jerusalem. And and here, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, as we read through this story, you're you're going to want to say, you're going to want to look back 2,000 years and shout at the people in this account. And you're going to say, don't you know who he is? That's the apostle Paul. Don't, Don't you know? Don't you know what this guy has done? I mean, he has been faithful to take the gospel into very difficult places. This is a guy, I mean, this guy started churches. This guy has confronted hypocrisy. He has stood for the authority of scripture and and for the purity of the gospel. He's, he's, He's confronted church leaders to make sure that we don't have a watered down version of what the gospel is. I mean, this guy has even risked his life. He has suffered emotionally and mentally and and physically for the sake of Jesus. Don't you guys know who this is? This text is going to make us want to say that, but what we see is that that is not how Paul responds in this passage this morning in Acts 21. And actually, he responds exactly the opposite of how we would be tempted to respond or even how we would want him to respond. So I want you to get out your copy of God's word. If you have one this morning, if not, there's one in the pew back in front of you. And we're gonna be in Acts 21, picking up in verse 17. 
of this, this text here. This is where we left off last week. Last week, Pastor Jason left off with Paul on his way to Jerusalem. Well, now he is here. And actually, I'm gonna pick up in verse 18. And I want you to think this morning of the narrative that we're gonna read. I want you to think of it in basically four Four movements, okay? We'll call it four acts of a play this morning, okay? So in act one, we are going to see the interaction with Paul and James and the Jerusalem elders, the church, the the church of Jesus there in Jerusalem. These first few verses, Paul is going to encounter and meet up with these guys. So follow along. I'm actually gonna pick up reading in verse 18, because they've come to Jerusalem in verse 17, and then in verse 18, on the following day, it says that Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. Now, pretty good start, correct? And this feels like a big deal, doesn't it? When, when, you know, kind of setting the stage for what's gonna unfold here, here is Paul, the great missionary, the great church planner, and he is coming back to Jerusalem. And he is going to meet up with James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. And then all the elders of the church there in Jerusalem are going to be present. Now, Paul's coming. He's been working tirelessly among the Gentile churches that he started to collect an offering to bring back to the church in Jerusalem to help them in, in their great need. And so, so the scene is set for a really big moment. And here is Paul arriving with Luke and some of his other people who are, who are with him. And here they come. And it's a meeting. It's like the who's who of the church leaders of the day gathering together. And Paul is able to present the offering and then he's able to tell them all that God has been doing, all the people who've been coming to faith, how the gospel has, has, has jumped the ridge. It's left Jerusalem and now people are being saved all over the known world. It's exciting for Paul to be able to share these things and you think it's getting off to a great start. It says they praised God for what Paul said. But then the second half of verse 20 kind of, it takes an unusual kind of strange turn. And let's pick up right there in the second part of verse 20. And it says, they heard what Paul said, they glorify God. And then they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who've believed. And they're all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. So what then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. So, very strange when you, when you kind of look at what's going on. On one hand, it says, oh, and they praise God for what happened. They gave the appropriate church response. Great job, Paul. Good job, brother, but the famous word, correct? Oh, that's wonderful what God has done, but we got something we need to talk about, Paul. I mean, it's great that you've been traveling all over. It's great that people have been coming to faith. It is great that God is making one people for himself, united in Jesus. Like it is wonderful, Paul. Yay, go God. But we got some people here in Jerusalem who are not real happy. You've said some things that have kind of put a burr under the saddle of their camel. They're, they're not real excited about what's going on. You're not being Jewish enough, Paul. You're focusing a little too much on Jesus and not enough on Moses. And we're not real excited about that and you're causing some problems for us. So yeah, good good job, Paul, what you're doing. But now that you're here, let's focus on the real thing. It doesn't sound like they're real sincere in in their praise. And so this is the meeting between Paul and James and these elders within the church. 
And now they say, but here's Paul, we've got an idea. Here's what we want you to do. And here we go into the second act of our story. Look with me in verse 23. Look at what it says. It says, so therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who were under a vow. So take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. Now, a lot going on here. We're not going to unpack all of it, but basically what you need to know about what's going on is that there are four men who were under a Nazarite vow. They have made a voluntary choice to take this vow. They've entered into this season, at least 30 days, where they've committed to, to not drink any wine, to not cut their hair, and no, I have not taken a Nazarite vow. Um, and, 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 and they have been living set apart for these 30 days. And now it's coming to the end of those 30 days. And what would happen is that for seven days, they would go and they would purify themselves. They would live in a little corner of the temple complex. And for seven days, they would be there. They would be fasting. They would be purifying themselves. And at the end of that time, they would cut their hair and they would then burn that. Uh, as kind of a sign that the vow had been fulfilled, that it, that time was over. And along with that, they would have to offer sacrifices. Each man would have to offer three animal sacrifices, a female lamb, a male lamb, and a ram. It was enough food, each one of them. Uh, that Those sacrifices were enough to feed at least 100 people. That's how, that's how expensive this vow, how costly this vow was for these men to fulfill at the, at the conclusion of it. And so, do you, so now you can kind of see, here's what Paul is being asked to do. Paul, we want you to make this grand gesture in order to show people that, that you are still very much an observer of the law. We, we, we don't like that you're ruffling some feathers here and that you're preaching that there's grace and freedom in Christ and that you don't have to keep the law in order to be saved. Paul, we know that's true, but we've got some Jews who still want to keep the law as well, and you're upsetting them. So Paul, if you would just go ahead and and go through these motions with these guys and pay their expenses. In other words, provide the sacrifices. Man, that would be great, and that would solve the problem. But now here's the deal. This was expensive, and Paul is not a rich man. I mean, Paul has been working bivocationally as a tent maker just to pay his own way. Paul doesn't have a lot of money. Some theologians, some scholars believe that in order for Paul to do what he's being asked to do, he had to take some of the money from the offering that he has been collecting all around the churches he's been planning. planning. These, this money that's supposed to go for the poor and the hurting and those who had lost their homes and their jobs to help support them, he's, some believe he's got to take some of that money in order to, to purchase the animals for these sacrifices. But Paul does it. If we read on in the text, Paul actually says, okay, if that would help, then I will submit myself to your request and I will do this. I will go through these motions. I will even take seven days to stay with them on the, in the complex of the temple and go with them through this purification process as they complete their vows. I will do it. And so Paul goes through it. He even puts himself in harm's way by spending seven days in the very place where there are people who hate him, who want to kill him. Paul is placing himself in danger as well as taking on a huge expense of his time and his resources. Then in Act 3, at the conclusion of these seven days, as they are coming to a close, let's pick up in verse 27 and look at what it says happens. It says, 
Paul is there with them. And then in verse 27, and when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temples, they stirred up the whole crowd and they laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and he has defiled this holy place. Now, number one, They're spreading untruth. Paul has not done what they're accusing him of, but they stir up this mob and this mob mentality then, if we were to read on in the text for the sake of time, we're not going to, but here's what they do. They grab Paul and they drag him out of the temple and they slam the door behind them and they start beating him with the intent to kill him. And the the crowd is growing and the sounds are getting louder as Paul is beaten and beaten and beaten. And and, and this this scene gets so intense that there is is some Roman soldiers in the Antonio Fortress that is located just looking over the temple complex and they see what's going on. They see the commotion and the ruckus that is being stirred up by this mob. And so so one of the leaders of of the Romans, this, this tribune, he says, we're going down there. And so it says he takes like over 200 men with him and soldiers and they go to break up this mob. And they save Paul's life in the process. And so they they have to pull Paul away from the mob. So much so that, I mean, at one point it says they have to pick Paul up and carry him into the Antonio Fortress to get him away from the mob because they've lost it. They are so angry. They've been worked up and stirred up so much. They are ready to kill Paul. And then act four, Paul, bloodied, bruised, probably broken ribs, like swollen eyes and lips from all of the, all of the blows that have been inflicted on him, torn clothes. Paul looks at the Roman tribune and he asks permission to address the Jews who were beating him. And he gives him permission. Look at verse 39. And it says, Paul replied, talking to the tribune first. He says, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no obscure city. And I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. It says, and when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, so the scene is set. Here is Paul, probably barely able to stand, probably barely able to see, right? Beaten, broken, battered. And he's getting ready to speak to his own people that have just done this to him. And if you want to know what he says, you'll have to come back next week. (laughs) But here's what I want us to focus on today with the time that we have left. Last week, Pastor Jason helped us see how God had so worked in Paul. He had so strengthened the faith of Paul that Paul could set his face toward Jerusalem even though God had shown him that what awaited him there were bonds and affliction and suffering. But Paul said, hey, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain, if the gospel will be spread through my death or imprisonment, then here I go. And we said, what an incredible faith that was for Paul to take those steps and to do that. But here's today in our text, I want us to see something else that is is happening in Paul's life. Not only is he willing to lay his life down, he's willing to lay aside something that if we're honest, is probably harder for us to lay down than even our own life. And that is our preferences and our pride. Let that sink in for just a moment. At first, my first instinct when I read this would be like, no, it's not. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, 
Yeah, it is. I care a lot about my preferences. I care a lot about my pride, sadly. And sometimes I think I would be more willing to lay my life down than I would to lay aside my pride and my preferences for the sake of the gospel. And that is what we see Paul doing in this text. And here is why, and this this is the thing I want all of us to walk away with today, is that the message of the gospel, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what he came to do, it had so gotten into Paul and it had so worked its way into Paul and transformed him that his identity was no longer wrapped up in in anything but the gospel. And it was because of that that he was able to lay aside his preferences. He didn't want to be doing a Nazarite vow. He's laid down his pride. You really think that the way James and the elders treated him was really with the respect he deserved? I mean, they were focused on such little things. Do we ever do that in our churches today? God is on the move. God is working. People are being saved. Lives are being transformed. Marriages are being restored. God is working. But preacher, it's too hot in the auditorium. I don't like the songs that we're singing. Could we do a little more of this one instead of this one? I mean, we focus on the smallest things. Our preferences are right here and we can't sometimes see past them to see the bigger thing that God is doing. And way more often than that, we don't want to lay aside our pride. It's like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I've done? Focus on me. What about my needs? Our pride and our preferences are hard for us to lay aside. And that's what we see Paul laying aside here. He's motivated by the transforming power of the gospel. I want you to see two places where Paul writes about this. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter nine with me for just a moment and see if these words illustrate what Paul is doing in in Acts 21. In 1 Corinthians chapter nine in verse 19, Paul says, for though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jew, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. And to those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel. Does that sound like what Paul is doing here in Acts 21? He says, whatever it takes, the gospel is primary. I am secondary. So whatever needs to happen for Jesus to be exalted, that is what I'll do. And if it means my preferences and my pride have to be laid aside, then so be it. I will do it because it is the gospel that has consumed me. It is the gospel that has transformed me. And I want to live my life in surrender to my King, Jesus. That is Paul's heartbeat. And we see it being lived out when it really gets real here in Acts 21. But we also see Paul's heart in Acts 21, and I believe it's the same heart he's writing about. Flip over to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Listen to what Paul says. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul is so burdened for the Jews, his people, that he says, if if I could be cursed, 
If I could spend eternity in hell so that my kinsmen could have their eyes open and see who Jesus is, then I would do it. Because that's how important the gospel is. That's how transforming it is. It has made such a difference in my life. I would go to whatever lengths I had to to make sure that they know Jesus. Church, we've seen Paul willing to lay down his life, but the gospel has transformed him in such a way that even as he lives, he's willing to lay aside the things that sometimes we hold most dear so that people would know who Jesus is. Now, when I first read this, text, I thought the big thing that we're seeing here is Paul going to these links for the sake of unity in the church. He's laying his preferences and pride aside because unity is primary. But the more I read, the more I meditated on this passage, I began to see, I mean, unity is a byproduct when the gospel is transforming us. Right, and we're laying aside our preferences and our pride because we've been consumed and we're being transformed in our daily lives by the gospel. Yes, unity will be something that happens because unity requires laying down our preferences and laying down our pride so that we can be one and, and, and on mission and on purpose together. Yes, that happens. But Paul's primary reason for laying those things aside is not so that the church would be unified. It's so that the gospel would be visible. We set our sights too short sometimes. We focus on smaller things when the bigger thing for us to see is what is it that Christ has done in us through the gospel and are we allowing that gospel to change everything about us all the way down to our very identity and that is what we see Paul doing and the unity that it is creating is just a byproduct of the bigger thing that is going on here. But here's some news that I think all of us need to consider this morning, a reality that we all need to consider. It is not possible for us to lay aside our preferences and pride unless our identity is rooted in and our lives are being transformed by the gospel. We can't do it. We can't do it. I mean, even, even the times we think we're being selfless in and of our flesh, there's probably something in that selfless act that we know is going to benefit us, isn't there? We might lay down a preference for a little while, but eventually the attitude of like, well, I've been the one, I've been the one giving in long enough. Now it's somebody else's turn. Right? I've done my time. Now somebody else needs to step up. Right? We in and of ourselves, in our flesh, cannot do it. It is only, only when we are being transformed by the gospel that we are able to lay aside the very things that are going to elevate the gospel message and the beauty of what Christ has done for people to see. It is as it's being worked out through us. Think with me for a minute what that would look like if you were so being transformed by the gospel that you were able to lay aside your preferences and pride. What would your marriage look like? How would that change your marriage if both people within the marriage relationship were laying aside their pride and their preferences? Would you have a different kind of marriage? How about with your children, parents, If you were laying aside your preferences and your pride, any selfish motives or ambitions or what will people think of me if my kids turn out like this or if my kids do this, right? But if your whole purpose was I'm gonna lay those things aside, right? And I'm just gonna, I want to pour Jesus into my kids. I want them to see the gospel living out through me and I want them to see that in me so that they understand that they need it. How would your family look different? How about your job? How about your profession? 
if you viewed your profession not through the lens of what can I get from it, but what has God given me? What talents and gifts and abilities has he given me that I can use to serve him in the workplace? How can I use my profession for his glory rather than being first and foremost thinking about myself? Teenagers, kids in the room, you're not off the hook. I know I talked to your parents, but you guys are on the hook too. How would your relationship with mom and dad look different if you thought about others before you thought about yourself? If you thought about how you could serve mom and dad rather than what you could get from mom and dad? Or your siblings, if we want to go there, but that's a whole nother sermon, right? If we're going to dig into those relationships. College students, young adults, how would your future be different if you could lay aside your preferences and your pride and say, God, what do you want to do with my future? You think those relationships, you think those things would look different if pride, selfishness, preferences were set aside and what we were looking for is What is it God wants to do in these relationships and in these situations? I've got good news for you today. It can be so. And it's not a five-step process or a 12-step program that is gonna get it there. It is one thing and it is found in the gospel. It's when we are so immersed in what the gospel is and what it is doing in our lives that it actually becomes our identity. Think about that identity with me for just a minute. Think about what it is, and then you'll see how it can change all of these things. We were people who were dead, who have been made alive by the very Spirit of God that is now living in us. And guess what? That allows us, that gives us the ability to now live our lives for Christ when we didn't have the ability to do so before. You now have the power in you through the indwelling spirit to do these things because you're now a dead man who has been brought back to life, a new creation in Christ. That is what the gospel says about you. That's what the gospel does for you. You are also a guilty person who has now been completely forgiven. Guess what? That now allows you to show forgiveness to one another. You don't have to hold on to things. You have been forgiven much. You can now show forgiveness. The Bible says that you were an enemy of God who has now been reconciled to God. That allows you to be reconciled to him and help to reconcile one another within the body of Christ. Reconciliation is possible because it's true of the gospel. The gospel says that we were in bondage to sin and we have now been set free by Christ. That allows us the freedom to walk out our faith and to show love and to serve God by loving and serving one another. The Bible says that we were poor, that we were broken, that we were orphans and we were lost and without hope. But now we are adopted children of God who've been given eternal citizenship in heaven and a glorious inheritance in his kingdom that will never perish and it will never fade away. Guess what? That allows us to go and let go of our false sense of entitlement. It lets us hold loosely to the things of this world and to live generously toward others. The Bible says that we were objects of God's wrath, but now we are recipients of his lavish mercy and grace. Church, that now allows us to extend undeserved kindness and show the mercy and grace of God to those around us, even when they don't deserve it. Do you think the gospel changes everything? Do you think the more we meditate on the truth of the gospel and what it has given us and what it is meant to do in us, do you think as that becomes more of our identity, you think it's going to change things? What about our church? You think if each and every one of us were being transformed by the gospel and when people looked at us, they were seeing less and less of us and more and more of Jesus, You think it'd make a difference? 
Church, that's the incredible thing we're seeing in this story. We're seeing in the life of Paul as we've gone through Acts. The more we read about Paul, the less of Paul we see in Paul. And the more of Jesus we see in Paul. It's the most magnificent thing about this text. It's the power of the gospel when it becomes our identity. We're gonna transition here in just a moment to a time of communion. And as we do, I wanna help us begin to prepare our hearts in, in a different way. I want you to turn, if you've got your Bible, so you can follow along to Philippians chapter two. If you don't, the words will be on the screen so you can follow along there if you'd prefer to do it that way. But as we go to this text, here's the thing. We see Paul laying aside preferences and pride in this text because he's been transformed by the gospel, but he is following the pattern that was set for him by our Lord Jesus. And in Philippians chapter two, we see a beautiful picture as Paul sits in a jail cell and he writes to the church at Philippi. He says, here is what I want you to do. Here is what what I am doing. I am following the example of Jesus. Would you too follow the example of Jesus as people who've been transformed by him? Follow his example. And now let me share with you the example we see in Jesus. And he writes this beautiful passage. As we read it this morning, I want you to ask yourself, are you allowing the gospel to work itself into every fabric of your being so that it is becoming more and more of what people see when they see you? Is this becoming more and more your nature? This example that Jesus set for us. Let's, let me read it for us. As we even begin to prepare to think about Christ laying aside his pride, laying aside his preferences so that we could be redeemed. Let's ask ourselves, are we willing to lay things aside, to humble ourselves so that Christ can be magnified in us? Philippians 2, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen and amen. Church, that is what is possible when you and I will follow in the example of Jesus because we have the ability to do it because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, when we will submit to that and allow God to continue to mold us and shape us and do that, we will exalt that name, the name that says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We have the ability in laying these things aside to magnify Jesus in a way that others 
can know him. As you take these elements this morning, I want you, as you open the bread, I want you to think about what we read in Philippians. That Jesus Christ says, he laid down his life, he humbled himself. His body was beaten. Isaiah tells us that it was pierced, that it was striped. Our Lord laid aside everything in order to take the stripes that we deserve, the brokenness that our sin had caused us Jesus' body was broken so that we could be made whole. And scripture said that when Jesus was with his disciples in that upper room, the night before he was to be crucified, it says he took this bread and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Philippians tells us that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. It says he emptied himself. There's so much in that passage. But the picture in my mind as we come to the Lord's table is the blood that was spilled, how his body was emptied of its very life source. Why? For you. And for me, so that we could have the very thing that we needed, but the thing that we didn't deserve, Jesus bore our sin. Scripture says he became sin. And Jesus said with his disciples that night that this cup represents the new covenant, the new life that is in his blood that is shed for you and for me. And he says, when we take this to remember him, would you take the cup with me this morning? As we close our service today, our worship team is gonna come. We're gonna sing a final song together. It's a time of response. I can never tell you, none of us that stand here can ever tell you how to respond. I can only say that it is imperative that you do respond as God is moving in your life. If this morning you have just been convicted, if you have just seen that the pattern of your life as a believer is not that the gospel is becoming more and more evident in your life and there's some things you need to lay down today. These steps are a great place to make an altar before the Lord and lay those things down. If this morning you realize, I don't know Jesus, that that what he did for me that we just read about, I've never received that. The gospel isn't, isn't transforming me because I've never received it. I've never bowed my knee to Jesus and confessed him as my Lord and Savior. This morning, we will have ministers at the front who would love to talk with you about how you can place your faith in Jesus. We're gonna sing a song that says, yet not I, but Christ in me. What an anthem of response this morning as we consider this passage where Paul laid aside his pride and preferences. What are we willing to lay aside for the sake of the gospel as our identity becomes more and more shaped by the gospel working in us more and more. Would you stand with me? God, would you have your way in these moments as we close? Do what only you can do, we pray in the name of Jesus. Let's sing together. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer? 
There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hope, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold my shadow. Sure, the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold my sin has been defeated. Jesus now. Amen. And we are so glad that you were here today. If you are a guest, just like Pastor Chad said at the beginning, we hope that you'll take just a moment to let us know that you were here to stop by the tent, say good morning to Kathy. Let us give you a gift. Let us be able to share a little bit more about the church with you so that we can help you find out if this is the place where God would have you plug in and do life with this body of believers Man, we hope you have a wonderful week. Let me pray for us and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you, thank you this morning for the gospel, for the transforming power of the gospel as we leave here today. May we meditate on its power and what it says for our everyday life and may it continue to mold us and shape us and transform us so that we can live as those who have been redeemed. Yet not I, but Christ in me. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.